This episode of the Planet Microcap podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance, regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for your support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. If you're listening to episode 173, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. Now, I wanted to start off by thanking everyone who attended and participated at the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual. We had a record turnout, and it's because of you that we're able to surpass all of our expectations. We'll be announcing our next virtual event soon, and stay tuned for all the information about our 2022 Planet Microcap Showcase, which will be in person at Bally's Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. I, I got to say, I was just there over the weekend, and Vegas is back. So I'm really excited to get back there soon. Now for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Guy Spear. He is the managing partner and principal at Aquamarine Capital and the author of The Education of a Value Investor. We were introduced by Matthew Peterson, managing partner at Peterson Capital Management. He's a great friend and joined me on this podcast for episode 133. So I highly recommend you go and check that out. I've known about Guy for a long time and couldn't believe that this would actually be possible. So I'm incredibly humbled that he joined me for our conversation. For those who don't know Guy nor read his book, uh, Guy got his start in microcap land. And not only did we chat about those experiences, but we also discussed his journey of self-discovery, discipline, understanding oneself, and how that can help you as an investor. If there's one takeaway that I had, and it was an incredible reminder that in life and investing, enjoy the process, enjoy the work. Chances of success are small. So, you know, you're better, right? (laughs) So I I know I am, I'm enjoying that ride. I'm enjoying that journey. And I just wish that uh, with all my being for each one of you. Thank you again for tuning into episode 173 of the Planet Microcap podcast. And please enjoy my conversation with Guy Spear. everybody to the Planet Microcap podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and I'm very excited to introduce our next guest today. He is uh, joining us all the way from Switzerland, the author of The Education of a Value Investor, as well as the CIO at Aquamarine Capital. It is Guy Spear. And for those of the French uh, speakers, you know, Guy Spiret, right? I think I'm close. (laughs) 
Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the English version. So, Guy, thank you for for joining me today. How are you doing? Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to Robert. It's a pleasure to be on the show with you and everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you all, at least virtually in this uh, setting. Uh, as as Robert is allowed to call me Guy, you can call me Guy anytime you like. But I've learned that I should not call Robert in the conversation that we had prior to starting by the word, the three-letter word that begins with B and ends with B and has an O in the middle. So I'm not going to do that, Robert. You can call, no, no, Bob is cool. It's Rob. If someone calls oh. me, it, oh my gosh, I, I got Bob, that wrong. Bob, Bob, I love. Hey, look, when we're <laughs> listen, we're already. Hey, look, it's. I think it's five o'clock where you are right now, at least. So we're we're technically at the bar. You, we're at the bar. Okay. You can call me Bob all day. So, so everyone, do not do not flip the first letter from a B to an R. Or whatever you do, you know, the what, B just, is fine. The R is not. The just, R is fine so long as it's part of a, a six letter word, but not if it's part of a three letter word. I get it. You, you know what? And now as a result, I'm going to get trolled and I'm going to have to change my name or, or <laughs> to, to be being okay with being called Rob. So no, I no, thank you, you for you, that. You can just cut this part of the conversation if you like, you know? <laughs> nah, this is too good. No, I, I, I like, I like the band. Well, no, you know what we were chatting about right before we went, we went on, uh, on to record was talking about uh, clubhouse. You yeah. know, uh, I, I recently admitted to you, I, I deleted it because I was just, I was getting too many notifications and that was always a signal to me of like, all right, if I don't want to get the notification, I might as well delete it. You know, yeah. everybody has a different way of uh, in their their uh, relationship with apps and stuff like that. But have you been enjoying the the process? Are you still going to keep using it, or wh what do you think? I mean, uh, I I think that I uh, I do really well on um, in live talking, so I find it far easy to talk about what I'm thinking than, for example, to write it down. I find that far harder. And so I think it's a medium that naturally appeals to me. It's also a medium that naturally appeals because it's sound only. And I think I thought that was very special. So I got invited in sometime in February, promptly spent about three hours a day on the app for the first two weeks, browsing around, finding out about a bunch of people. I got, I was, I, you'll, you'll enjoy this. In one of my first calls, I was on there with Perez Hilton. He's like from Los Angeles. And the friend who'd invited me is friends with somebody who's friends with Paris Hilton. The next thing I know, I'm in a room with eight people with about 600 followers. And Paris Hilton's just woken up. And for me, it's like sort of afternoon or so. And I don't know. I mean, I didn't know who he was. But so that was not that interesting for me. But there's guys like Brett Weinstein, who's this, this sort of like big name podcaster that I think has a lot of interesting things to say. And every now and then you have Elon Musk, who's there. I, he was he was doing a call with some of the guys from Robin Hood, I believe. And so that's kind of, it, there's something very exciting about feeling like you can be in a room. And you could even ask some of these people a question. They could go up on stage. And then I've hosted a couple of rooms, and that's also been fun. But my problem is twofold. One is that whatever you say doesn't go anywhere. So what's worthwhile here? Robert, is that we're talking and these words are going to be recorded for posterity, which is kind of cool. And they can be replayed and they can be listened to this long form. It's um, ever, potentially evergreen content. So uh, that that is a problem. Uh, and there was another one that just slipped my mind, but it'll come back to me because I'm, I'm super jet lagged. I just got in from New York City this morning. But um, the, the, oh yeah, the other one was the, just the time sync. I found it very hard to go into the app and not be there for like three hours. And so that was problematic as well. Yeah, uh, no, the recording part, that was, that was for me too. I'm like, you know, this is great. I could share my thoughts. I could bring people on, but I'm, at the end of the day, like this is just, this is potentially such great content that I can't record it and share yeah. it. It's just showing up. I mean, I get it for brand building and all that, but it just, it so, didn't compute in media brain of mine. Yeah. And I think that the problem that the, I mean, I guess they could force you to sign a user agreement as when you sign up that says, I understand and accept and agree that I may be recorded and what I say may be, re, may be replayed somewhere else, but that, that could have had a huge dampening effect on signups. So um, but look, the fact of the matter is people can record. There's ways to record clubhouse conversations, even if they don't allow it. 
And maybe they're just trying to hit a critical mass of users and then they'll allow recordings. And maybe what they'll do is they'll say, look, and, and then, you know, we could do this conversation effectively. We could have had it in Clubhouse with a live audience, uh, which could be also very fun. I mean, some of the best podcasts are where somebody gets interviewed in front of a live audience and you sometimes hear the audience's laughter and it creates this, there's a live live effect, which is really powerful. So I'm not willing to write it off or anything. Right. And um you know, I, I'm also, I, I think that what I, what I understand happened, I don't have the details, is that they were in development, but they realized that they had this unique opportunity to launch the company during lockdown, and that was a smart thing to do. And so they launched right. it about 18 months earlier than they wanted to launch it, which I think was smart of them, really smart. And, you know, as a, as a guy who invests in public markets, I'm super frustrated that so many of the very best ideas are emerging in private markets. They're emerging around companies like Andreessen Horowitz, who I think are the key investors in Clubhouse and Sequoia Fund and others. And you know, I I, just, I have to wait till Coinbase goes public at the sixty billion dollar valuation, and you know, sort of like one hundred and twenty times revenues or whatever it is. Well, let's let's start. Let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit because that's something that bothers a lot of us as microcap investors and looking at microcaps is that not as many great companies are going public earlier or they're doing it not in the U.S. You know, they're going yep. to Canada or, or Australia or something like that. So, it, I mean, what what have you noticed there as well? What's been your impression? It, it was a perverse effect of Sarbanes Oxley, I believe, uh, and also the legislation that has a different name that came out. And after 2008-9, and it had the best intentions, but had a perverse effect. And so it became far more expensive for companies to go public, far more expensive for companies to maintain their listing. And uh, it's it's had dampening effect on that part of the market. There's no question about it. And I mean, uh, some of my most successful investments were not properly listed companies. So we're talking about pink sheet companies or companies that lost their listing from NASDAQ, but it wasn't so super expensive for them to keep the listing. It, it, it wasn't so super expensive that they found a way to take themselves private. They just said, okay, we'll be unlisted. Whereas now they just say, they, the good, many of the good companies just say, well, we're going to go private uh, or we're just not going to go public in the United States. And yeah, it's a big problem. And um not that I want to sound political, but it's possible. I don't know what was on their agenda, but I'm certain that the kinds of people who were in the Republican Party, had it been elected back, had on their agenda to simplify. I mean, they simplified a lot of taxation, as I understand, and I think they would have had it on their agenda to simplify this. I mean, effectively, the result has been, as you said, to drive business outside of the United States. And what's the point of that? And the markets that they're going to are far less transparent than what the United States had. So... But it's the nature of the game, Robert, that I've come to accept that when you're in the financial services industry, the plus side is you get to hang out, look at computer screens, talk to people on the phone, read stuff, make a decision every now and then. It's a pretty nice life. It's great work if you can get it. And the downside is that you're going to be regulated. And the regulator doesn't know, you know, they don't ha know how to spell investment, investing, so to speak. They're they're kind of very ignorant of and they and the regulatory hand comes with a it, it paints in a very coarse painting. It's not a fine painting that they do. And that's just the nature of the beast. That's part of the game. And so we we have to keep adapting and adjusting. Uh and um the truth of the matter is, I mean, we you didn't ask me, but so uh I mean, one company that I made a lot of money in. Was a so it was a British, maybe not microcap, but it was an Alta AIM listed, so not listed on any of the major exchanges in the UK. It was a company called Weetabix. They they make cereal, uh, and in the United States, uh, you know, the smallest market cap I invested in was about ten million dollars <laughs> market cap, and uh, yes. uh, there was another one with twenty or thirty million dollars market cap. But um, you know, you you need there's a lot that you need to get right in in companies that are that small. And you need to sort through an awful lot of promotions, an awful lot of outright frauds, and an awful lot of situations where even though they look cheap and they probably are cheap, 
uh, there's a there's a group of management that are sort of using the vehicle as their retirement fund, and they figured out a way never to to be removed. And so, in a certain way, it's like a bit like a closed end mutual fund that can never be broken open, so to speak. So, so there's a a lot of things that can happen in the small cap world that you really have to pay a lot of attention to and make allowance for in one way or another that you don't have to if you get to larger cap companies. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the questions that I, I, um, cause one of the things I did to prepare for, for our interview today, um, was, uh, listen to your Google talk that you did with Sarab back in 2014, who by the way is amazing. I, I, yeah. I, isn't I, he I a lovely Sarab. guy? Yeah. So I heard him speak at a, the microcap leadership summit, um, in Chicago, I think it was a couple of years ago. And he's, he's quite incredible, very soft-spoken, mm-hmm. but I mean, just so much knowledge, but yeah. at, at, at that talk, Along these same lines, somebody asked you uh, during that chat about how what you're doing requires just such a great amount of effort, you know, as a value investor, you know, doing just so much due diligence on companies that you will be adding to portfolio. And he asked you, you know, if you don't beat the S&P, is it worth it? You know, yeah. and I and I ask that question a lot to myself when you think about microcaps. You know, is it worth it? We're doing so much just tough work here to try and find one or two investments. Obviously, when you find a winner and, and it's life changing, of course, then you say it's worth it. But sometimes like that, that is a slog. You know, so for you, I'm sure you ask your that so your that question to yourself all the time. Is it worth it? Um, you know, is life worth it? <laughs> what is worth it? You know. <laughs> So, but I mean, I think, so. I, I remember that question and he put me on the spot. Uh, I think that um, he he, put, he asked it more pointedly than that. He said, you know. Oh, I'm he, sure he, said, he did. I don't ask questions yeah. very pointedly at all. I just yeah, kind of. He, he said, he, he said, <laughs> you've, you've, um, you've beaten the S&P up to now, but who says you'll beat it in the future? And maybe right. you've gotten here and it's just luck, you know, and maybe when you get to the end of your career, you'll be able to look at it and say, this was just luck. I applied no skill. And, um, and I kind of, it, it may, I mean, I was prepared for it, but it made me, it would make anybody uncomfortable because it's asking the question that Charlie Munger has asked, which is you have a whole bunch of super smart people in the investing profession who are, if anything, um, destroying value because, because, because they'd be, you know, you'd be better off just putting the funds onto autopilot. So, so yeah, is it, and then and then you know so kind of like you you know if you're if you're this guy who's preaching um, sound investing and capital allocation and you know taking care of the resources of society and then it's at the same time you're actually negative you're destroying value you know your negative economic value add that's that's not great and what Charlie Munger says that's just denial people are doing it because it's a good living if you can get it and they're just in denial. And then you asked another question is how to feel personally. And um, look, I I can tell you, Robert, I, so far, 23 years, I've beaten the S&P by, uh, you know, by 2% margin. It's not as big a margin as I would have liked. It's not, it's not the, the, you know, the the mid double digits that I would like. It's, it's like, it's right around 10% annualized. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it's not it's not the number you know I started off in this doing this and I thought oh I'll get eighteen percent annualized if I'm really good and I'll at least get fifteen percent annualized and here I am sitting with five uh, percent less than that but I don't know that the the portion of the money that I'm running which is my own family's money I don't think I would have compounded it even at that rate if I had not had it in this vehicle and I'd not been doing what I'm doing so. And I would say even now that, you know, I think that all of our investors sleep well. I think I take little to no risk. And um, uh, there's a value to sleeping well at night, even if you just match the S&P or even perhaps slightly underperform it. Uh, So, and then I guess, you know, the simple answer or the simple response to your question is that no matter what you do in life, the probability, it's so hard to succeed and the probability that you'll fail or that some other event will take you out while you're trying to succeed at whatever the hell is you're trying to succeed at, you better like the process. You better enjoy it. You better feel like at the end of the day that you've done a good day's work, a satisfying day's work. And, you know, you might be painting away for 30 years and turn out to be Van Gogh, or you, or you might be painting for 30 years and fi- turn out to be an absolutely no name. 
And by the way, Van Gogh died a no name. So you just better be satisfied by what you're doing every day. And um, I think that for that reason, some of the people who do really well, whether it's micro cap or other kinds of investing, because they really enjoy the process of digging and finding stuff out about things and that, you know, figuring out how stuff works and how things are put together and why things tick is just really exciting for some people. It's not exciting for others. Uh, you know, my wife would rather I learn how to change light bulbs and how the refrigerator works when it breaks down. And, you know, she gets a handyman to do that. But, you know, and I'm, I am interested in how some companies work, I guess. So is it worth it? And it seems to me, I mean, we, for the listener, Robert and I have never met in person, but it seems to me that you, you clearly love the process. I mean, you'd do that. You'd say, I, I get the feeling you'd do it if you were paid to do it. If you had to pay to do it, I mean. Oh, I would do it. I would do it for free. This is, <laughs> the, I mean, I mean, the pot, listen, we just started taking advertising on the podcast, so I have been doing it for free. <laughs> but I, I, I would, if, even if we got never another dollar for, for doing the pot or anything like that, or even if we sold the business, whatever it is, like, I would just hope to continue to keep doing this podcast yeah. because it's just, it's just that much fun. By the way, real quick on that note that you said about your wife, my wife would like me to do that. I don't know if you see my shelf. I'm just hoping it makes it through this interview at this point. You know? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see if it does. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, yeah. But, but would you, would, would you say your, how, how's your love of the game changed over the years? I mean, if you, if, if, if anybody listening has read your book and, and full disclosure, I haven't read the full, I haven't read the book yet. I will be reading the book, but you know, we going through some of the, Robert, you can do the audio book if you like, you can do the audio book. I want to, I want to read. I, I told, <laughs> I told you, I told you offline. I don't, oh, I'm, I don't always have the most time to read, right. but there's certain books that I do. Like right now I'm reading the um, Phil Knight book, the Nike book and that it's taken me a minute, but it's, it's just, I, I do, I do enjoy the, the physical book and, uh, and, and getting after it. But I mean, I think that, how would you say, I, th I think that, uh, if what's interesting for me is that I'm uh, I'm no longer doing the work that I do because I need I do need to put food on the table, but I know I can put food on the table without doing the work. So the work is no longer about keeping the wolf away from the door. It's about um, what do I actually want to be doing with my life, and how do I want to be living my life? And you know, I have I'm 55 years old, so you know, I'm not 25, 55 years old, uh, you know, okay, so if I'm lucky and I live to 100, that'll be another 45 years, that would be great. But I might die at 75 years, and that would be 20 years away. That's not so far away anymore. So how do I want to fill my days? What actually do I want to have my days filled with? And for example, I was having lunch with a guy yesterday, who had read my annual report, a friend, a good friend, a very smart guy, a former Intel engineer, and and he said, oh, you you know, you could you could juice your returns by doing um, by by doing covered call strategies, for example, or by selling puts instead of just buying the shares. And I kind of said to him, yeah, you're absolutely right, I could. But those extra seconds that I'd have to spend looking at the monitor, the seconds that I could spend looking at the view from the beach, for example, or walking in the mountains, and I actually choose not to make the money that I could make from doing that because it's just not something that I want to be doing, end of story. And to get to a place where I'm, I'm consciously saying, you know, yeah, I could try and optimize the portfolio, but if I've got to spend an extra, you know, 40 hours a week doing it, looking at a monitor, then I don't think I want to do it anymore. And that also comes down to investing. So it's only in the last four or five years that I've realized that there are some companies that even if it was clear to me that I could make a lot of money, I don't want to invest in them because I don't think they build the world in the right way. And it's not like being a passive uh, minority investor. I'm kind of building the world if I buy their shares. But you know, I just don't want to be a part of it in any way, shape, or form. So uh, there's a French lottery company that a friend of mine has been pushing on um, – you know, you just have to look at your Twitter feed to find out what your 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 friends are. It used to be you had to go to a bar with them, have a beer. You know, then when they've had a little bit of beer, they'll tell you what the stock that they really like. Now you just have to look at their Twitter feed. So I'll mention his name because he said it in public. It's a it's a company called uh, it's a French company called Française des Jeux, and they have a monopoly 
a state monopoly on um, on lotteries in in France. And I, you know, I mean, I know lotteries provide entertainment, but I find it somewhat distasteful. I kind of pretty much ruled it out. And I've ruled out a bunch of other things I, because I just want to invest in businesses that build the society in a positive way, if you like, or their positive contribution. And so you get, I get to choose where I do my research, if you like. And I'm still learning where those places are, and I'm updating my ideas about where, the, where those places ought to be. So I've been trying to learn more recently about cloud computing, as everyone is, just to sort of understand where the economy is going. But I choose to do that. I don't have to do that. Um, yeah, and and then I think that I think that when somebody's starting out in their investment investment career, you're looking to talk to as many people as possible, because every every new conversation teaches you something new. And um, if I had the same energy as a 25 year old, I'd also talk to as many people as possible. But I think that now I'm looking for smart people, smart ways to talk to people. So, you know, I could talk to these 20 people or I could do market research interviews with these other 20 people, or how do I figure out the person who knows the answers to all of those questions and talk to them? And is there a way to talk to them, for example? Well, um, that, that actually hits on one of the questions I wanted to ask you. And I, I it, it was, you talked about this also in the, in the Google talk a little bit, but well, it was mentioned, I'm not sure it was explored as much as maybe we can right here is, is why are the right mentors and partners critical to that long term success, not just on Wall Street, but in life? And for you, I mean, how, how do you know which ones are the right ones? You know, I'll tell you, um, one of the ways to well, the only way actually, to, uh, to, um, to discover who are the right mentors for you is, is when and I'm curious, I'll ask this question of you, Robert. I'm curious to see what you say. Sure. You kind of like have, you start having a powerful reaction to somebody. And it's not necessarily positive, but you just start having, you notice, you notice like a powerful reaction, like I hate that person, or I'm so envious of the life that they have. I think that actually often one of the best places to look for a mentor, the right mentor for, for me is, am I envious? If I'm envious, that means I've activated something in me. And, they've, you know, you, one shouldn't suppress those feelings. Uh, emotions are a call to action. So, you know, if I'm hearing envy calling, then I can ask myself, why am I envious of that person? Because usually envy kind of says, you know, it, it, the, the, the emotion of envy says to me, let's say, guy, that person's got something that you want. And I'm going to make you feel envious about it because you actually could get it. You know you could get it or you know you deserve it. And so that kind of triggers, well, what are they doing that I'm not doing? What, what can I do that would uh, make me closer to where they are? And maybe, there's the, look, I, could, you know, I was envious of Warren Buffett, but I, could never have, I can never wake up one day and have a father as a senator or not a senator, a congressman. That wasn't going to work for me, but other things were. So that doesn't necessarily mean that all the actions can be taken. But I think my point to you is that uh, it's very visceral. The, the decisions that one, ha one ought to take, I think, in life are visceral. They come from what you're actually feeling. It's not some kind of Zen place where you go and meditate on a mountain and somehow the sort of thought appears. It's like if you're feeling raging emotion, then that's probably a good thing. That, that's you know that can be channeled in in very very powerful ways, um, and so you know you could even argue that it's not it's not me that selects the mentor it's the mentor that selects me so to speak, you know and there's this wonderful phrase when the when the student is ready the teacher appears, which is kind of a similar kind of idea you know don't you know if somebody keeps presenting themselves in your life whether they're in your physical life or just presenting themselves as a person. I think that I haven't done enough of sort of standing back and saying, why is this? Why is this and what should I do about it? Because just they present. So some part of my mind is pulling them in to my thoughts. But then to say, well, why is it being pulled in? Why is that person? What is it about that person that's digging something in me? So, um, you know, and I, I would say that I revere Warren Buffett and was so happy to go and have lunch with him that time and all of those things. Um, but I, I don't, I no longer envy his life. I don't want to be Warren Buffett, you know, 
I, I Warren Buffett, uh, and it's been. I'm not the only one who said it. He he he's so happy living the life that he's leading. That's a too narrow life for me. I don't want to spend my like I don't want to spend my time get, making money off covered call strategies, for example. And um, so you know, I think that for example, Charlie Munger raises more envy in me right now. Uh, another kind of sorry, I'm pouring myself some tea here. I made myself a pot of tea. There's my English pot of tea, and I got some milk here. Forgive me. There's the milk. Um, I think. Charlie Munger does raise more envy in me because he's done so many other things. He's read far more broadly. He's built student dorms. He's donated to all sorts of charities. He's got this big and wonderful family. Uh, he's um, mentored people like Li Lu and others uh, to become better investors. So, you know, I think that um, he's a broader personality who's li lived for me uh, a far richer life. You know, I'd rather have his life than uh, Warren Buffett's life. And um, of course, now Warren Buffett, if you gave Warren Buffett Charlie Munger's life, there'd be too much distraction in it. He wouldn't want that. He'd be very unhappy in Charlie Munger's life because he just wants to keep it down to the so that those narrow basics of investing. So, Guy, how have you been able to channel what some would say is one of the seven deadly sins, the, you know, envy? And how have you been able to channel that into something that becomes a positive reaction for you because that's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's a, it's a great question, Robert, a really, really great question. I'll, I'll take a slightly easier version first because, and then we'll see if we can get to envy. So, so, you know, anger. Uh, so I wouldn't call Yeah. I guess envy is a kind of a sin, but anger, uh, you know, somebody said it, it, getting angry. It's easy, is easy, but to get angry with the, right person, the right place in the right way. Now that's really hard. So anger is a signal that your boundaries have been violated. And then the question is, well, what do you do about those violated boundaries? And you ought to do something, but it may not be walk up to somebody and yell at them. Uh, it might be whatever it is, there'll be a, an intelligent strategy to, to kind of figure out how not to let those boundaries be violated again. So, I mean, I think that, that, in, in the case of envy, I mean, I, I'll give an example of uh, uh, envy that I've experienced in the last few weeks and in the last few years is that I was a student with a whole number of people who are now running the United Kingdom in one shape or another. So none of them are friends of mine now because they're too busy and that world is a small world where they all talk to each other and they don't have time to talk to people from outside that world. But uh, Boris Johnson was never a friend, but David Cameron was never a friend either, but I shared tutorials with him. Um, uh, I knew uh, Dido Harding. These are all people that people in the UK would know. She was the year above me at business school. And I hung out with her with other friends for a certain period of time. The former foreign minister of the United Kingdom, or, or um, uh, you don't call it foreign minister in the UK, you call it, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember, foreign secretary, is a guy called Jeremy Hunt. And he was a guy that I hung out with in Korea of all places and was a friend, not a close friend, but was a friend at Oxford. So I feel envy for those people uh, because I kind of feel like I could have been as successful as them in British politics and I feel like they should somehow acknowledge me as part of their circle because in a certain way, well, not in a certain way, I, I believe I'm as smart as they are and as capable as they are. And I feel also a slight amount of anger because I think that they would benefit from my insights because I've had a very different life to their life. And kind of in a certain way, Oxford's failed. Uh, it's that generation because by putting people like me and them together in the same university, we were supposed to become lifelong friends. And that, that kind of cross fertilizes, but that never happened. And so, you know, I've spent time thinking about that. And, uh, you know, I mean, one option would be to say, okay, I'm done with investing, I'm going to go into British politics. Uh, but, you know, I'm still figuring it out. So I, I don't think it's easy. But I think that, um, you know, it, it, so, so, so it's a call to growth. Envy is a call to growth. You have to grow 
you know, there's, I, I believe that if you look hard enough, you'll find, I will find with regard to that actions that I can take. I'll tell you one that I think maybe the right direction is that I've toyed with the idea of starting an, an, a publication. So there's a company called Ruffer in the United Kingdom. They're quite a large asset manager. And once a year, they produce a very, very nice sort of like review document, review I mean, the, the, it would be a bit like the New Yorker, something like that, with kind of a collection of great writing. And so, so that, you know, the response may be to say, okay, well, here's, here's a way I can give vent to that. So I think the, the question to interrogate oneself, you, know, you interrogate myself with the, with the emotion of envy to say, okay, so you're feeling envy, what action can you take that's going to kind of bring you closer to what you're envious about. And it's something to do with having power and influence and having people respect me, if you like, and respect me in a broader sense than just in the financial world. And so, you know, in the same way with this, you get super angry at somebody, it's like, okay, what boundaries have been violated? What's the best and most productive way for me and them to communicate this in a way that life gets better? So, you know, envy is, envy is far tougher in a certain way than anger because because sometimes what's underlying envy, you know, is like just, you know, I, I spent a long time feeling envious of Bill Ackman. Now, this is an example from my book. Why was I envious of Bill Ackman? Because I was there running a small fund. He was running a big fund. I was trying to be master of the universe. He was master of the universe. I was living in a very nice apartment with no park views. He was living in a kick-ass apartment with park views. And, um, and so I was envious of that. And, and, you know, my first way to getting there was just to try and work harder, smarter, more aggressively, and, you know, make my way in the world of New York hedge funds. But ultimately, through thinking it through, I kind of said to myself, well, do I really need all of that? Actually, how about you just change the scenery? So I found another way to deal with that envy. The minute I came to Zurich, all that envy disappeared. I didn't feel any envy anymore for any of those people because I was living an extraordinary life. Maybe, maybe the what I'm reaching for is that envy is a call. So if you're really satisfied with your life, then you don't feel envy for people who have more of anything. If you're a movie maker and you great make great movies, yeah, you know Steven Spielberg's movies have been more successful, perhaps, but you don't feel envy for him. You're happy for him as you're happy for the success of your movies. So. I think it's a call to growth and it's a call to change something. In my case, moving to Zurich took care of my um, envy of uh, Bill Ackman for sure. I didn't have any env envy for him after I moved to Zurich. So it's a really interesting emotion and one that probably does not get written about enough and is not used enough to guide action. But uh, you know, I think it's I think it gets confused with greed, right? You know, it's it's. I, I mean, would you say there's a big difference? I mean, you talk about in your book how you started off as wanting to be like that Gordon Gecko going on Wall Street. Yeah. You know, greed is good. You know, the line. They're, I mean, they're highly. It's true. They're highly related. And since I wrote the book, I've had, I haven't read enough. But you know, um, the guy whose book was published at exactly the same time as mine, Peter Thiel, zero to one. He studied, he studied this French philosopher when he was at Stanford called Renaud Girard. I've tried to read his stuff. It's not, it's pretty turgid. But, but, you know, I got, I think I got the basic idea, which is that humans are designed to compare themselves to other and to want what other people have got. And there are whole businesses built on this. So, you know, you get a few Chinese, rich Chinese ladies walking around with a Louis Vuitton handbag. And now all these Chinese ladies want Louis Vuitton handbags. Why do they want it? They want it because they've seen some figure who's got a Louis Vuitton handbag. So, um, you know, the, the greed, I think, is just say, saying, uh, I want more. I don't have to compare myself to anybody else. I know that I want more. And greed is also this idea that more than you need. So, you know, the greedy person says, I don't care if I can't sail in two yachts at the same time. I want two yachts. You know, I need two yachts. I don't care if I can't spend the extra billion dollars. I absolutely need the extra billion dollars. Whereas envy is just wishing you had it because somebody else had it. I mean, they're closely allied, really, really closely allied. But, but I think, you know, me acknowledging and recognizing my own greed, which I did in the first chapter of my book, was extremely liberating. 
And, uh, you know, it's something that if David Cameron, I don't know how close you follow British politics, but um, he's uh, <laughs> so in the much. course of, well, he, there's a sort of scandal with a non-financial company called Greensell that was uh, supposedly the next best thing in finance. And the former prime minister, David Cameron, got involved and lobbied the um, UK government to help this company, which ended up going bankrupt uh, for all sorts of reasons that I think that I could have told him beforehand was very, very likely to happen, uh, given the business model. But the reason why he was doing that was greed. He wanted to make a lot of money on his stock options, basically. And I think that it was far easier for me to analyze and learn the lessons of my episode at D.H. Blair because I just said, yeah, I was greedy. I was greedy. I was looking to make a lot of money quickly and had my head handed to me. I mean, that is a, that is a story. That is a theme. <laughs> that is a theme in the financial markets for sure. Every day somebody wakes up who wants to make money, a lot of money quickly. Absolutely. I mean, I got to ask, I mean, you know, you, you moved to Switzerland, you, that helped you get rid of the envy that you had for Bill Ackman and, and probably other, other envious aspects of your life as well. But do you wish you had that mentality when you were first starting out or would you not change the thing because it got you to where you're at today? Oh, do I wish I had which mentality? The, your your current mentality of, of, yes, still having envy for things, and that keeps pushing you in certain respects, but how you, you were able to, when you moved to Switzerland, you let go of that envy in, in quite a big way, you know, but but think, do you wish you kind of had that mentality when you first no, started? No, well, I mean, I think that if you don't, feel, you're not feeling emotions in a certain way, you're not alive. If you're feeling envy... Agreed. And, and can't find a way to kind of progress against whatever goals that envy is generating. And that's a super unhappy and frustrated place to be. And so I don't want, I don't want that level of envy back. I want, I want the progression. I want the constant emotions not too intense. And I want me responding to those emotions in a productive way, not a non-productive way. I mean, I'll give you a way in which I respond to emotions unproductively. I, um, if I'm tired and I'm stressed and it's late at night, you know, something like a bowl of cereal is just really great. <laughs> it's just a really nice thing to do. If you're 25, that's probably fine. But if you're 55 and you, and you don't want to put on a lot of weight, that's not going to help you very much. That is, that is me feeling anxiety and not having a good outlet. <clears throat> Excuse me. And not having a good outlet for my anxiety. So, uh, you know, I was feeling envy and I didn't have a good outlet for the envy. And so you want to feel the emotions, but then you you got to find an outlet for it, you know, and you got to sort of find some way to let it go. And I think that life productive energy comes not because you kind of generate it from nothing, but because you feel these emotions and you channel them in the right direction. And if you can channel your emotions in the right direction, your personal power is through the roof because so many people think they, they have to deny certain emotions and pretend they don't exist. And, you know, you, that just never happens. I mean, they're going to come out one way or another, you know? And um, it's a kind of tantalizing because if you get it right, then, you know, there's just, there's just a snow stopping you and what you can achieve. And the thing is you achieve it on the same level of energy that you'd put into whatever else it is that you do. And I would tell you that, you know, uh, um, men who, I don't believe that you can be unfaithful in a marital relationship and be as, as successful in business. I think that many of the most successful men in business are taking all that sexual energy and they're kind of finding ways to be creative in the business world. And they're not dissipating their energies. They're kind of using it in some way or other. And, um, you know, in the same way that if you're, if you're gay and you stay in the closet and you're using up all this energy to cover up who you are, I mean, it's tragic for so many reasons, but one of the reasons why it's tragic is that, you know, you, you, what energy have you got left after you've done all of that, you know, and, and how can you be creative and live a productive life if you're so busy covering up who you are? And um, it's really fascinating, actually. So these are such interesting ideas and uh, there are books that are written about managing your energy and it's like, it's, it's really important. 
Really, really important. And it's it's the key to a successful life. And I'm certain it's key to a successful life in investing. And um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I... I would, no, I'd have gone on to another point, but 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 my jet lag. I thought, well, pause and let's see where Robert wants to go next. Before we continue I mean, on another monologue. No, no, we were. I I was I was loving everywhere we were going with that. You know, it's just it's it's maximizing your creative output, right? And, and figuring out ways in in all walks of life, not just with investing. Yeah. And, creating new investing ideas, but just in general, you know, you make, I mean, you make a lot of good points there and I'm sure there's been a ton of research done on all of it. Yeah. But the knowledge is not as widely spread as it ought to be. And there's another aspect which ties into what you were asking early. Is it, is it, is it all worth it? You know, investing is something that we do for the future. So we're doing something now that will pay results, pay the payoff, you know, if it's real investing, the payoff is 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 one year or maybe five years away. But we also have to live like we might die tonight, because we might. You know, the asteroid might hit the Earth tonight, or God might t- decide to switch the whole thing off, or you know, or or our nervous system. You know, like I know a guy who's thirty two years old. He died of a brain aneurysm. Perfectly healthy guy. And it's just tragic. So you gotta you gotta like the kind of so that's kind of like the balance in investing and by the way i see you have it you freaking love the work that you do even if the the financial payoff is five ten years into the future but but there's a kind of you know there's a there's a there's a seeking emotion or seeking mindsets that you know if you have a dog and you know our dog loves squirrels i mean there's pretty much most things will keep him on a leash, but he sees squirrels and he goes absolutely apeshit. Or maybe it's squirrels at a certain part of time of the year or the month when they're exuding a certain kind of uh, scent. But, you know, that's the seeking function. You know, ears go down. He's like, he's on the fucking hunt. And he's never going to catch one of these things. But anyway, uh, but that, you know, the search, seeking something is like so much fun in investing. And when you think you're onto something, it's very fucking cool, you know? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say you, you've, you've realized that about me because it's true. And, and it's actually one of the reasons why I feel like I'm still don't feel as confident as an investor as I probably should be, but it's only because I hear such, I I'm just, I know there isn't one way of doing things and there's so many different ways that you can put, you know, just speaking to investing to make money in markets that it's because for me, it's a constant trying to, you know, I'm constantly learning about myself that it's a constant search for, okay, well, what, what works right, you know? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people listening probably feel that same, that same feeling. But actually, I, I also get the sense, I mean, we haven't collaborated on anything, but, but it's actually a very creative process for you. So it, it's very unusual that, you know, most people, you'd imagine that most people who are in the business of analyzing and discovering microcap securities would be analyst types, but you're actually in, in, I mean, you're a kind of creative analyst type. You're looking for things where other people wouldn't know how to look for them or trying to find an, a, a way of looking at them that will uncover hidden value. Whereas other people may not have figured out that way of looking at it, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I don't know because we haven't, we haven't spent all that much time together, but Maybe the next time, if we do another interview, I'll have read a bunch of your stuff and then. Uh... I, you'll probably just listen to it. I'm not much of a prolific writer by any means. <laughs> I, we share that. We share that very much in common. I, I'm not a. I'm not a huge. I you know I used to like writing a little bit more back in the day, but I my now now with this medium, it's just so much more fun to share yeah. share stuff this way. I, you know, I just, the, I'm much the only more thing fun. that I would tell you is that. Uh, Writing is really tough, mm-hmm. and uh, but it may be that if you if something is important enough to you, and you go through the great difficulty of doing that, what you get on the other side is pretty special because writing really forces you to decide what you think about something. Right. And so, I don't I'm not don't know that it's true in your case, but I think in my case, I ha- you know I I said. To myself, I'm a terrible writer because when I write, I just go through enormous amounts of pain. And then I got to a place where I realized that actually some of the pain that I feel when I'm writing 
is kind of like, because I'm trying to figure out what I think and that's moving the furniture around inside of me. And that's a painful and difficult process, but anybody would find it painful and difficult. And that pain is actually what makes it good writing on the other side. Right. Uh, and you may find that as well. I wouldn't, and I would tell you that uh, if you do a good piece of writing, then that stands forever. You know, it's just there forever after. I guess a podcast is as well, but but I don't think it has the same kind of duration as a really good piece of writing. So sure, yeah, it's something that lives on a paper versus a, a file. Yeah, you know, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And 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 I guess my point is that don't let the pain be a reason not to write. If you feel compelled to write something, don't let the pain turn you away, because the pain may just be a signal that you're about to do something really important. And yes, it's going to be painful, but I think that in my writing of the book and certainly in my writing of certain chapters, I went through enormous pain to write them. But at the other side, I was a changed person, changed way for the better. I mean, you know, and to take one example, chapter one of my book takes me, takes you through, you know, my Wolf of Wall Street experience in all its gruesome glory. And the pain of writing that chapter was not the words on the page, getting the words on the page. It was the willingness to actually tell the reader what had happened. And that was painful. But doing that and coming to re- coming to the realization that I was willing to tell the reader what happened, I was willing to own up to being that person who had was greedy enough to go and work at a Wolf of Wall Street place. That was where the pain was. And that was an extraordinarily productive thing for me because it allowed me to come clean with the world. I wasn't trying to hide a, pi- a part of my past anymore and to pretend it didn't it hadn't happened and didn't exist. You know, mm-hmm. uh, guy, another question that I had for you, and this is actually um, because, you know, we were hooked up through Matthew Peterson at Peterson, uh, Peterson Capital. And uh, thank you, Matthew. A little shout out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I hit him up to say, hey, you know, look, you know, you've had many conversations with guy, you know, him a little bit better than me. You've gone to the value. X. Like, what are some questions that maybe you or, or you know, core followers of guy would probably want to know? And he he was awesome. He sent me a video. He's at a barbecue with uh, with a friend of his is a gentleman by the name of Stan from Atrani Capital. And I thought he asked a really phenomenal question about, you know, just, just from a philosophical standpoint about the, the definition of value investing and, and how that's changed over the years and, and defining it and where we're at right now. Because it seems, that, I mean, this, listen, we could probably do another three hours just on this question, yeah, yeah. Alone, right? But, you know, for you right now, you know, what, how, how do you think about value investing? What, what value means? Well, first of all, we should just pause on Matt for a second. Uh, I got to know Matt uh, because we were both invested in a company that had to go through bankruptcy court, which was mm-hmm. one of the best things to come out of that was the relationship with Matt. And he's, I think, a really lovely guy. And I think he's uh, he will he will end up, he will turn out to be one of the world's great investors. And one of the reasons why that will happen is because he gets his relationships with people right. I've seen him. And, um, you know, I think that he's very lucky. I think he's blessed by his parents because I think it comes from having good childhood and good relationships with his parents. And then before you were going to ask the question, I thought, oh, so, so this is the way it goes. Matthew gives Robert the question that he doesn't want to ask guy directly but then he just lobs it to robert so robert can ask him which would have been fine as well but um uh you know i i think that so there's somebody that uh i you you should certainly follow and um to the extent that you want to get things published outside of your publishing world uh he's called john miljevic he publishes something called the manual of ideas and he tweeted not so long ago that saying that you know all this low price to book, uh, low price to earnings, all of those kinds of quote traditional measures of value uh, were just a lazy man's value investing. And what's happened in the last five years, at least, is that uh, you have to do way more work to kind of understand what's going on behind the numbers. In that you have some businesses that don't make any money that show zero profit. You have some company, companies that are making an absolute fortune, but they have super profitable reinvestment opportunities and they're in reinvesting all of their available cash and they're being able to 
make it look like it's current expenditure, whereas it's actually investment expenditure. And so, you know, the, all of that distinguishing between those two and the many different variations in between requires real work. It requires re real digging. And so to find, uncover value today, you need to be doing that digging. And that digging is hard work. And what people were doing in the past was, quote, lazy man's value investing. I mean, when I started doing this 25 or 23 years ago, there was a significant portion of the market that was looking at charts who didn't believe the fundamentals counted. So you had a whole bunch of competition that had the wrong models in their head. Now, everybody that I know of is a, value, is a fundamental investor. They agree that the value of the, I mean, it's a, it's a given that the value of the company is, is in some way related to the underlying value of the business. And the people didn't even see that or understand that or agree with it. And so the competition today is, is at least got the right models in their head. And so you have to, you know, the, the famous, I don't know if it's famous, but there's a story that I enjoy. So two men wake up on the African plain and there's a lion about to chase them. And one guy starts putting on his running shoes or gets ready to run. And his friend says, you're never going to out the line, run the line. The guy says, I'm not planning on outrunning the line. I'm just planning on outrunning you, you know? So, uh, only one of you is going to be lion launch that day. And um, and that's the nature of, you know, you've got to run faster or better than the other people. And um, so, you know, uh, just to bring this rambling thought to a close, uh, all intelligent inv investing is value investing. Uh, intelligent investors want to look to the business and they want to be able to value the business. And Simple valuations of the business don't work anymore because your, your your competition are people who can also do simple valuations of businesses. And there have been a few people who've been able to kind of update their thinking about how to look at businesses, especially, you know, cloud computing businesses and other new, you know, over-the-top uh, content businesses where they've been faster than others at recognizing that something new is afoot and they've, they've earned extraordinary rewards from doing it. And for me, all of that is value investing. It's all intelligent investing. You know, I, I guess I know that people use it and I cringe when it happens when they kind of say value versus growth, you know, it's like, but, uh, you know, uh, all intelligent value investing is value investing. All intelligent business investing looks to the value of the business. Good analysts will find, will figure out, uh, uh, you know, they, they will go way beyond simple metrics to figure out the value of the business. And, um, you know, many of them are intelligent investors, even even perhaps some of the people who've been buying Snowflake at, you know, 13,000 times revenues, you know. It's a rough estimate, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. Well, well, my one response I have to that is, you know, you bring up the idea of competition, amongst, you know, when you're amongst analysts, but, you know, one thing, especially that you see in micro cap is it's very much a team sport, you know, um, investing just in general, you know? So, I mean, on one, on one hand, you can have this competition between other intelligent investors, you know, who's, who has the better strategy or pick the better stock, but at the end of the day, you know, wouldn't you, would, do you care about it, sharing that information so that others can not just obviously share and maybe the idea and then go to invest in it, but also to help you potentially learn more about it. So you want others to be better than you in that. Yeah. Sense. I mean that is so, so uh, you know, any of us who are in the business of researching and analyzing stocks are in the business of managing information. And, you know, the reason why so many people who do it tend to have uh good intelligence they have high iqs is that it's not always obvious what to do with the information that you have and in many cases perhaps in i don't, I don't want to say in all cases but in so in perhaps the majority of cases you do want to share but figuring out how to share in what way with the right person you know with somebody who gives who who, who gives back uh, with somebody who's going to help you deepen your knowledge uh, and and I'm not going to come back to you with some idiotic response. Uh, all of those things take an enormous amount of 
insight, experience, wisdom, intelligence. And so, but but at the end of the day, you know, my point to you would be that, yeah, so, so investing is something that can be done when you hunt in packs, but you better pick the right pack to be a part of because some packs like to eat members of the pack, you know, and you think you're on the same side and it turns out that you're not. Uh, but also at the end of the day, any way you look at it, uh, when you're buying something, a share of a company, somebody else is selling it. And you better have a good sense that the person who's selling it, uh, you know, you, you, you want to know, you want to have a good sense that they're not selling it for reasons that are inimical to you. Like they're an insider and they know so much more than you about what the actual prospects of the company are, which of course would, might, might be very foreboding. In another example, it just may, may just be that they need liquidity. They've bought a new home and their shares have tripled in value and they want to take some money off the table and buy a new home. I mean, so, but you are, you are when you buy something, somebody else is selling. You better have a sense of why they're selling to you. And I would tell you that that's a heuristic that uh, I use all the time. So, you know, I'm unlikely to own shares of um snowflake at such a high valuation in spite of such extraordinary and i just for your readers and listeners and compliance i don't own any snowflake um uh but but you know i'm not gonna go uh, i'm you know so all i want to know is where i'm gonna die so i don't go there charlie munger said all he wants to do is avoid stupidity and you can get quite far in life very far in life but just avoiding stupidity in a certain sense, I, I want to only buy shares off people who are either distressed or upset or have foreshortened time horizons or you know some, some tangible reason that I can see why they're selling. Because if I can't see that reason, then you know maybe I don't have such a good deal. And so that, for me, rules out all IPOs because somebody's selling it to me. They have a reason to sell it to me. You know, there's there's a research service called Tegas, which is really good. I don't know if you've come across it, but not it's it's not true of every single company that's on Tegas. But the vast majority of companies on Tegas are there because somebody wanted to do the research. And if you look up, forgive me, I keep bringing the name of the company up because I'm reading his book right now. Um, they're like you know, like half of I'm exaggerating, but half of all the interviews on Tegas are for this company Snowflake, and so there's an enormously promoted company and a lot of people who want to see it succeed and who've got written investment research about it. I don't want to buy shares in that kind of environment. I want to buy them when everybody's hating it or when the sellers at least are, you get my drift. So um, I don't remember what your question was. Just the idea of investing being a team sport. And I oh, yeah. think to summarize very quickly, it's about picking the right team, right? Just like picking the right mentors. Yeah. Right, pick, pick, understanding the right mentors and partners at the same time, yeah. at, at the same token, it, you can you can take that same concept and yeah. kind of use it for a team. And so, to become a better I- investor within that team sport of investing, um, so first of all, everybody plays it differently, right? And there are there are some really significant skills. So here's something that I did not know 23 years ago, that is kind of so totally obvious to me now, which is that. I do my very best, and I think I succeed, at treating anything that is told to me as private until I have permission. That person who originated it gives me permission to share. And that's kind of like a life strategy in which if I do that, if Robert figures out that that's the case, then you may be more willing to share stuff with me that is not for public consumption and it might not be for public consumption for all sorts of reasons. It might not be, it might be that you don't want to embarrass somebody or that you are, you yourself are not allowed to share it except in certain circumstances. But I, I saw this in an invest, investment bank, a friend of mine, that you can really build trust by doing that. By contrast, there may be some, you know, trial teammates where not only do they uh, share information that you didn't want them to share, they front run you. And everything that you do. So another thing that I uh, always do, which is kind of honorable, but again, is, is long-term greedy. You'll get better results over the course of a lifetime is if somebody's originated an idea for me, so they're like sort of doing research. Uh, they talk to me about it. We do some research together. 
I won't buy it until they give me permission to buy. So I want, why is that? I want people to feel like they can come and talk to me about their ideas and that, that I can see that idea flow uh, without them being worried about whether or not I'm going to front run them or not and just go and start buying and driving the price up at illiquid, illiquid security. And so uh, there again, learning how to behave myself and selecting my friends as people or my my teammates, my my pack mates, as people who understand those same set of rules is, is kind of critical, actually. Um, yeah, and I think that, you, I mean, I, I get the sense, Robert, that you could run a class on that, actually. How to, how to hunt stocks in teams, what to do, what not to do, what to share, what not to share, how to go about sharing, how to go about buying, you know? It'll be, um, it'll be, it'll be five minutes. Don't share anything that's not public. No. <laughs> well, that well that anyway. That's, no, the, just, law. Yeah, that's, that's the law. That's the law. But no, no. But I, 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 I was a bad joke. But yeah, I know. Yeah. I know exactly. I know exactly what you're saying. But um, so look, I want. I, I think we could again go probably for another two, three hours here. But you know, I'll save that for the next time we do chat. Uh, because I do, I think it's not, you, you jet lag, like I want, you got to get some sleep here soon. So my, 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 fi- my final question for you today is, you know, what, what investing experience would you say impacted you the most of everything you've gone through? You know, what, what impact, what, what experience of, has really impacted you the most? You know, I got to talk about a couple of micro cap stocks that I invested in. Okay, can I, let's can I go. Talk to you about those. Please do. Uh, Everyone, everyone's gonna fast forward to the end now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, so I don't know how I found it. Well, I do now. I was interested in for-profit education, and I thought it was an amazing space. I'd had an investment in DeVry Education that had done extraordinarily well for myself, and I found this company that uh, it, it was. It had started off as a video conference business video conferencing business 20 years ago. So it was called EVCI, Educational Video Conferencing Inc. But that business had not succeeded. They were too early. And uh, they'd bought a for-profit college called Interborough College. And they were doing something that I think was pretty special in that they uh, they were really helping college dropouts get a college education. Now, this was not a Harvard education but the, you know the, the, their prospects on the job market after they'd gotten this education were, were were way better than they. These were people, so they'd help them with their graduate equivalency certificate (GED). And um, well, the way it happened is that I went and talked to them, and they had a, an overhang of debt. And I and a friend, uh, we we bought shares. We we converted. We bought the debt and converted it to equity at the current market price. And so like, like I and a friend each bought a million dollars each and we each, we each owned 10% of the company after the conversion, something like that. And that removal of the debt overhang uh, and, and some, I think, uh, reasonably good business management resulted in the 7x on the share price. And I was kind of like, that's the kind of thing that can happen in a micro cap. You're probably like, yeah, that happens to me every day, guy. What's the big deal? Now, that was the, the positive and then, then, so the negative was that uh, the, the management, um, and this is the problem with small caps, is that you really better know that the management team is on your side because they, it would have been impossible to remove them. And they decided that they had done really well with this business and they should all take huge salary increases. And they took huge salary increases to the extent of like 50% of uh, EBIT or you know, earnings. And so it was a very, very significant chunk. And the the business ended up getting pulled apart because the Obama administration was very, very against these private for-profit educational establishments. They just felt like there were, there was parts of the industry that, that the Obama administration felt were fraudulent because they're kind of offering this degree certificates uh, to, in a way that the government didn't like. I think it's it's less of a clear picture than the Obama administration made out, but um, but you know I did make seven times my money, but I did make about three and a half times my money, which wasn't a terrible outcome for that investment. So how's my? So I mean I learned a lot in that story alone, and and I actually talk about it a little bit in my book. Um, I mean, look, in a certain way, 
every every investment requires a post mortem, and every investment teaches us something, really, doesn't it? But that you know, that's that's one little potted story. I learned a lot about what to watch for in management teams. Why? What? Because I I kind of tried to help the management team to understand that what they were doing was irrational. Uh, first of all, if they wanted to take the extra money, they should have taken it as capital gains, not as current income. Um, second of all, it was the, exactly the kind of thing that would have drawn the attention of the regulator, which it did do. Um, and uh, I didn't understand why they would do it. And I think that one of the big lessons for me from that investment is that often you see behavior which looks completely irrational. But until you fully understand the circumstances of the people taking that taking those actions, you know, you can you will be able to see that it may not look rational to you or to an outsider, but from the perspective of where they sit, they're actually doing a completely rational thing. And in this guy's case, the CEO, who was a significant shareholder, was going through a nasty divorce, and um, he was in, in danger of having to give up half the shares in the company to his wife. And it was it was beyond a nasty divorce; it was raging warfare. And the guy lost perspective. Uh, and uh, he realized that if he took current income, he wouldn't have to give that over to his wife, at least not until the divorce settlement come through. So somewhere in his mind, he, he thought it was okay to raid the company at least a little bit for high salaries. And, you know, it's sort of like if the wife was going to get half the shares, then he was going to find a way to make the shares worth not very much. <laughs> so those kinds of factors are something that happens in small cap investing that you really have to watch for and understand. But then, you know, some of the world's great companies have not, have been micro caps that came public in kind of some weird way. And actually I would tell you, Robert, I think I should spend more time looking for them. And one of the things that happens to me is that, you know, I'll screen for them, but, but then I get sort of, um, you know, there, there's a very high uh, fraud and crap factor at that end of the market, and I get fatigued because you're kind of looking through. It's a bit like panning for gold. You know, you've got to get through a lot of sand before you get a speck of gold. And sometimes you get just tired of panning through all the sand, and it's just like one after another, you know. And you just, and then the hard thing as well is that I'll see marginal situations, and I ask myself, well, maybe if I dug here, I would be able to identify that this is so marginal, meaning that you know, then it might be a diamond in the rough, but it might not. But, you know, what if finding out if it's a diamond or rough takes you 100 years of polishing, you know, to see if it's just stone or diamond. And I think in many cases, you know, it's like you, you have to commit to doing an enormous amount of research to figure it out. And so maybe a lot of, a lot of that sort of panning for stuff is trying to figure out, well, where, where can I actually make three phone calls and get in and, get in and figure it out, you know? But, I, you know, I would tell you that, I think I was on the phone earlier today to a guy who I think is a brilliant analyst. And I, I'm not trying to be falsely modest here. I don't think that I'm a brilliant analyst. I think that if you start this business the way I did, I didn't have all the time to develop into some kind of brilliant analyst, even if I had the intellectual capacity because I was busy building business. And we joked about how I was both CEO, but also postman. That's not entirely true. But for a significant part of the life of this business, the time that I could have spent analyzing was spent licking stamps and, you know, writing checks and doing all of that kind of jazz. And um, yeah, how'd I do? <laughs> you did. You did great. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, did, you did fantastic. So, yeah, ask your bees, so, dig it. You, I saw, well, I think I think we'll end it there, guy, because I, it, I we're we got we're gonna we're gonna put you to bed. You know, I think we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna tuck you yeah. in and let you let you do things. So, and the thing with, is, like, yeah. I I didn't want to delay anymore. I didn't want to keep you waiting. And so 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 Chantal yeah, scheduled you in, which is yeah. Hey, you know what? If it had to, it had to. You know, it's all yeah. good. That's how that's how I treat these things. You know, I I it's. I always like to be available whenever the guests get, because I know you're right. giving your time to me. Yeah. You know? So it's yeah. for me, it's look, I'm in LA time. I know I, if I got to wake up at 4 a.m., yeah. my time is, to do, do you do it sometimes? Oh my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. if you, uh, the interview was, Sa oh, Sarab, you did Sarab? No, no, I interviewed uh, Dr. Sanjay Bakshi, and he's he's based in, in India. And so that that was a bit of a time 
Yeah. Jump. I think that was the late, that was the latest interview I ever did. It was, I think we were at like 7 p.m. <laughs> it was 8 but 8 it's PM. so powerful because you just don't know who's going to listen to it, you know? Oh, and yeah. then the next thing you know, you've got connectivity to someone. And what I tell you is if, if you, if the listeners, if your listeners like this and, and you want more, I'm happy to do more. You're clearly a lovely guy and you've got an enormous amount of uh, people skills and EQ and you're effusive and fun to talk to. So, you know, if you want to come back for bite two of the apple, it's also possible you'll be like, no, that was bad enough the first time guy. No, no I've, 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 I have way more questions. That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, the, the one thing, the uh, one of my one of my longer questions I was going to throw to you is like, uh, because I, I study philosophy a little bit, and uh, yeah. well, all through all through high school, and then a little bit, I thought I was going to be a philosophy major. That was my, I thought that was my calling. I was was all just excited about it and just loved like ancient ancient Greek philosophy and everything. But I haven't I haven't read any of it in a long time. But that's one thing that I've 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 been finding that outlet in doing the podcast and speaking with investors like you is just, yeah. just, just get, just getting that, getting that, getting that back a little bit. You know, it's a, uh, you know, I felt like my, my philosophy training stopped when we, I stopped at postmodernism and I feel like it's evolved so much since then, or postmodernism is just has so many different branches since then. And investing in business, I feel like has really taken hold in a way that I don't think anybody had really ever thought it would. You know, I mean, you had Adam Smith, who was probably the most famous business, you know, philosopher yeah. out there. But but since but since then, and only until you know over the last 20, 25 years, you know, with Warren Buffett, with Munger, I mean, they're quoted just as much as any famous philosopher at this point. That's true. Right? You know, that's so true. that's I, that's what I find really fascinating. And I think that actually, for those of us, and I I think I put myself into, you know, I I'm primarily my my best medium of expression is is spoken word not written word and so for those of us who do like the spoken word you know this whole podcast thing has just opened up a whole universe of stuff that was close to us we kind of like you know we were at a relative disadvantage when it was just the writers the pen writers because they had all this means of expression but those of us who are better talking better thinking on our feet didn't but now the world's opened up to us okay. Can you imagine if Socrates had a podcast? How amazing the symposium podcast would be. That, I mean, is, can, that is a great that is a great analogy. Or well, not it's a great thought. It's a fantastic thought. I hadn't thought that, but you're absolutely right. It would have been amazing. It would have been amazing. It yeah. it just how how many new ideas we would have access to, you know, and not just, you know, through through play to, not just through. I mean, he did you know, he did uh, take a lot, write a lot down of his thoughts, but you know, just how, how amazing it would be. You know, you have Plato there, you know, he's the producer, he's clicking record for Socrates versus, uh, <laughs> versus right just writing everything. Ready really everything great down. point. All right. All right. Let's let you go. Guy, where can everybody yeah, go Robert, and find more information a- on you and, and, and follow you on, on all social media? It's a, you, you, need, you, you're asking me the question. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I was just going to rewind a second. Oh, sure. Because uh, on the research front, one of the ways you can research in packs now is through Twitter and oh, yeah. FinTwit and the kind of research FinTwit, not the kind of stock trading FinTwit. It's kind of an amazing place to meet people and learn more. And so, and, and I'm uh, after I watched a fantastic introduction to how to use Twitter properly by David Perel with a guy called Matt, Matt Kobach, I'm pretty active on Twitter. And, and so that's probably the best place to find me is at G Spear on Twitter. And uh, I do try to respond to all the DMs that I receive. So one way or another, even if the, D, if the message may be, send me an email, but I give out my email through the DMs. But I think that's probably the best way to find me is on Twitter. And um, that's the place where I'm most active. And I got a website, guyspear.com. And my business website is akamarinefund.com. But, but Twitter will take you there you'll find your way to me on Twitter. That's kind of you to ask. Thank you. And of course, um, uh, my book's available on Amazon. And, uh, you know, a little bit of, you know, a thought for all of your listeners. Actually, I have a rule for myself now. If I meet somebody in my life who's written a book, or I know I'm going to meet somebody who's written a book, I try to read the book before I meet them. Because it's kind of like, you know, instead of doing 
the first step of getting to know them and forcing them to recount, because every first book is autobiographical anyway, you kind of get that out of the way. It's like you've read the resume already type of deal. And so, you know, and most of the time people put a lot of thinking into what they write. So you get a more condensed version of who they are, a better version in a certain way than, um, than, than what you see in person. So, well, um, then in, the, in that case, I have to apologize for having not read your book. That's <laughs> okay. You, you, met, you met Matthew who'd read my book, so that's all right. He knew me well, and I'm sure told you lots about me. Oh, yeah. He, he'd send me, he actually sent me some underlined screenshots uh, from the book that he took that he thought would be good to chat about today. So I, I'm very grateful to yeah. Matthew for introducing us. And look, this is not the last time we'll be chatting. I mean, yeah. I, I think we should start our own pod called The Financial Therapist. <laughs> and just bring and just bring some PMs on here, and I th- and, and maybe some uh, some individuals, you know, like here we're gonna figure out who you are, and then we're gonna <laughs> and 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 then we'll help you. That'll that'll show you whether you're a value or growth. <laughs> we could do that as a clubhouse conversation, I mean, and then we uh, could do. We I'm happy to try stuff I, if I find the time, and then we just host it on our separate channels. It kind of be you'd, you'd get two files, and it's just hosted on two separate channels if you like. That'd be so. fun. That'd be fun. We well, can guy, explore. Yeah, no, it's I'm great sorry. to meet you. I, is it's that from too, just you. the th- sorry? This really is the blue no, no, thing go. behind you. The blue thing behind you is that from uh, Arrival? Uh, no, this is actually a, a patent for a surfboard. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so it, it was given as a as a gift a while ago. I'm a big surfer. I, I love to surf. Oh, yeah. I, I, I missed the La Bamba swell this weekend, but yeah. you know the, that that's what happens when you have a 15 month old. <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, you know, I'll get the next one and then take care of the 15 month old. Oh yeah, the waves will always be there. That's for sure. All yeah. right, that's- great, great to meet you, Robert. Great to meet you too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Talk to you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. This episode of the Planet Microcap podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance, regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com.